What's up, Boyo? I just love it when uh, when we build. We do so much work for this show. We do we so, do much, so work. much work. So much so work. So much thought goes into each and every episode. And then when you have like two episodes compared, we go like, you know what? I don't like this. Let's do this other thing instead. That's usually a great recipe. So really what you're usually trying to recipe. say is you put in so much work. <laughs> and I just come <laughs> and say like, that's shit. That yeah, sucks. Yeah, 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 no yeah, one yeah, wants yeah, to talk yeah, about yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. And also, by the way, I have an intro today that's not predicated on kids, which is crazy. Jeez. Yeah. Wow. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, I was at a meetup and I met a wonderful other person, VP Marketing, and uh, listener of the show. I was like, great. Obviously, you've given us a review. And you could just see the whole expression on the face shift. And it's like, uh, it's because I used to work for this company that did a lot of reviews. I'm not going to mention the company. So we weren't allowed to do any reviews. And that habit just stuck with me. I'm like, break that habit now. <laughs> no, <laughs> break but it. really, break it. she was just trying to be nice. She never yeah. listened to the show ever. <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> I was like, I listened to two that were terrible. Yeah. You don't want my yeah, review. Exactly. You don't want it. <laughs> but by the way, if you're listening now and you actually do enjoy it, we do enjoy reviews, so it helps us. It also more helps listeners. to support the show. Helps everything. support the show. We get more vanity metrics. It's good for me. I get to keep my job. That's you know, it. That kind of stuff. It's basically, <laughs> it's basically if you're no, no fun mickle. Yeah, you know? exactly. <laughs> so uh, speaking of keeping jobs, uh, yes. what happened uh, in the last couple of days is OpenView dropped their annual benchmarks. That's it. They dropped their annual benchmarks. Uh, we had they, Kyle here on the show. Yeah, we had Kyle, Kyle on the show and he said he, we're going to drop it soon. And then he got real quiet because he was going to obviously push it over the finish line. And he did, thankfully. And um, you have to remember, this is top quartile. It's uh, the OpenView portfolio. So a lot of PLG, they also kind of stack out how the respondents are. You know, they're firmographics, basically. Mm. And one of the things that kind of stood out to me and wasn't talked about a lot was go-to-market execution. This is the number one challenge CROs, CEOs, C whatever O's have at companies. And then not much more was mentioned around that. What it is was my immediate kind of reaction. No, there what, was, what, what there was literally kind of there's a slide with this chart on it. Um, and it's one of those like um, horizontal bar charts yeah. that is sorted <laughs> for the longest on top and then it goes slim really quickly. Yeah, yeah. And the, the, the biggest piece that everyone is concerned about is go-to-market execution. You know what you can't find anywhere in the whole deck? Yeah. Anything about go-to-market execution. And also, it's like, oh, PLG, pricing, all yeah. of that stuff. It's all <laughs> over the place. But that part, no. And no. if you try to Google what it is, it's like, this is how to make a go-to-market strategy or plan. You don't find, like, this is what it is. So I was like, do people, what what do they think it is? No, I went I went into the CRO function in uh, Pavilion Executive. Um, I took the screenshot of, hey, the, the biggest concern is go-to-market execution, you know. And then I asked all of the CROs there, and there, I, I mean, it's pretty dormant to a degree, but it's like 1,500 CROs in there. Yeah. I was like, what are you guys doing, or ladies, um, in order to be excellent in your go-to-market execution? And it was basically crickets. It's <laughs> <laughs> They're busy executing. They're busy executing. Either that, either that or everyone was like, you know, leave me alone. Yeah. You know? <laughs> um, but it was uh, there was not much actually coming out of this. And no. I was like, oh, cool. You know, new source of information. I could maybe bring this into yeah, the show. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, that's how it is. <laughs> so no proprietary Thanks, knowledge Sam. today. <laughs> Thanks, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> 99 bucks out there. Oh, it's not. Uh, anyway. So, um, you know, the way I interpret it was really your ability to reach target. I don't know how you see actually go-to-market execution. I think it's pretty important for us to just level set before we get into the meat here today. What are we? What is go-to-market execution? Yeah, I think I think hitting your targets kind of part of this, but it's also all the intricacies, all the you know turning of wheels and cogs, kind of in that machine actually happening like you want it to be, right? Yeah. For that, for me, that's good execution. If you think about a project that's being executed, well, you want that you know it's fast, it's high quality, it's on time, it's on budget, and so mm. forth. Well, that would you would say like, well, that was a really well executed project. Yeah. Right. Um, and I think the same translates for your go-to-market as a well-executed go-to-market. If everything is going, you know, I don't want to say as planned, mm. um, but it's going pretty smooth and really nice direction on time, on budget, on target, and so forth. I think that would encapsulate um, GTM execution. Okay, so this is one of the big concerns. And, and there's a lot of challenges also kind of being shared in that 
report, that benchmark report, right? Mm -hmm. Again, it, this is top quartile, which for me and on some level makes it even more scary that things like CAC payback, so the time to recoup your uh, acquisition cost mm. is going up. It's yeah. increasing. It's taking longer to get back that money. Did right. everyone hear this? It goes up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it extends. Yes. <laughs> it gets worse. Yeah. So, you know, this is this is one of those things, right? And um, I think it was also clear in the... That uh, one uh, one metric was ARR per FTE. Yeah. I think that was the only metric that improved. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's also easy to hack. And and no, I mean, what does it mean, right? It means that obviously, you know, lots of layoffs happen. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then you think, well, where are those layoffs happening? Well, they're definitely happening in the go-to-market teams. Yeah, for sure. And then, you know, why are they happening in the first place? Well, you know, you want to increase your uh, CAC payback, right? Mm. But, um, well, it did go up. Yeah. It didn't go down, yeah, yeah. right? So and then what that then means, a um, couple of things, actually. One is you might have cut the wrong thing. Yeah. <laughs> and again, there maybe grow, buy Roblox <sighs> next time. Uh, or number two, you cut the right things, but the market effects of uh, you know worse conversion rate, yeah. worse ACV, worse whatever, um, simply were so large that they consumed all the 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 CAC reduction that you basically had. Yeah. Right? Um, and in as a result, you know, CAC, CAC payback is going up. And when we say top percentile or quant, you know, quartile, the, quartile, yeah. it means like, hey, you know, this there's basically a, a selection bias happening here. Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, who is who is getting investment from open viewers like pretty, you know, good, reputable, you know, yeah, company, yeah. obviously. Only, you know, really, really good companies are getting that. Yeah. Um, and we're only looking at that slice. We're only looking at this top slice of the market, if you will. Um, and then, you know, that broken down and obviously, um, you know, outliers. Yeah. So outliers of the outliers and then just the normal outliers. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and when you look at that, uh, CAC payback is still going in the wrong direction. Yeah, crazy. it's crazy. Um, and I think the other piece is then uh, NDR. Yeah. Also worse. So net dollar retention is a new word for net revenue retention. Yeah. NDR is down yeah. across the board. And it's uh, they had this, it was a great caption. I kind of laughed a little bit, even though I should probably cry. It's no no longer land and expand, it's land and maintain. It's like, oh, <laughs> so sad. So sad. So um, I think the, the funny thing is, uh, I read this morning on the train to work, software spending is still increasing. <laughs> It's, it's going to cross, was a, I think they said a billion dollars. And I was like, that seems low, but it's it's still increasing quite a bit year over year. Mm. But in our industry of B2B SaaS? I think it's I think it's more than just that, right? It's, um uh, you know, all of those companies, they're not only selling to B2B SaaS. There's, there's some some other stuff is going on here as well, right? Um, and I think this is this is what's kind of going across this. Um, I think uh, Jaco and Sam and all of these guys are calling it the golden age of, of SaaS is over. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm not sure if I would call it that. I, I would just say the easy the easy age of SaaS is over. Yeah, yeah. Now we're, now we're all sadly becoming real companies. Yeah. And I know <laughs> a lot of you people try to flee from, you know, the Accenture's, McKinsey's and, you know, yeah. Goldman Sachs's and Mercedes Benz's and Masks and I don't yeah. know whatever company on the planet um, to go into this, um, you know, espresso on demand yeah. uh, <laughs> work <laughs> environment. I think that is that is probably kind of changing just a little bit. Yeah. I think we're being corrected into, hey, you're, you're not just, you know, sure you're exciting and stuff because of, well, uh, instead of trying to recoup all the costs with the initial sale, you can do it over time. Yeah. So you can make the initial sale really small, which makes it easier to sell in the beginning. And instead of only selling to enterprise, we, you can now also sell to SMBs. Yeah. There's so many wonderful reasons. Um, and now all of this is just being like, yep, we know about this now. It's priced in. Now you're just, you know, chemicals was pretty new 100 years ago as well. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and that's basically what's happening now. Yeah, so there's uh, a lot of new textbooks we need to learn about finance, I guess, and uh, how to operate a business for profitability. And yeah, yeah. And, and the funny thing is, um, you can just go to your local library. Um, yeah, it's, <laughs> <laughs> these they textbooks exist. all exist. You need to dust them off maybe a yeah, little bit. Yeah. Um, but maybe this is where some of the um, business school education that we all some of us receive. <laughs> 
is maybe starting <laughs> to be like, oh, this is what they were talking about. Yeah, yeah. Oh, they didn't teach me growth at all costs. No, that's I true. learned that by doing, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can spend a lot of money here to grow. Um, cool. So what does this mean, right? So I think one, one thing that's kind of, you know, we forgot here almost is the... And, and this might be an outcome or result or something. I'm not quite sure where to where to put this or an input. Um, the the buying process is getting a little bit more sophisticated. Yeah. Um, people are not making just snap, stupid, silly buying decisions anymore. There's usually a CFO involved. There are many other people involved. A yeah. lot of people are around the table. Are more like ah, let's just not buy it. Yeah. Um, and uh, especially when you suddenly have eight or nine buyers uh, that need to make the decision chances just simply go up simply by math that one is going to say no yeah uh, and and sometimes that's even enough to torpedo the deal right yeah. and, and and you know let's see let's see if we're going to get out of that conundrum eventually but those are all you know almost the micro the micro things are happening that's maybe causing some of the macro impacts. yeah i think it's also like we talked about in a previous episode that today to book a meeting it's way more touches mm -hmm. and that then also follows this way more touch points where you can mess up and mm -hmm. potentially lose out is the same mm -hmm. in a sales scenario. If you have more meetings, that you know puts more pressure on you as a seller as well to do a great job in every single meeting. Yeah, I also got to say, I mean, um, in addition to that, um, and I think this was also some pavilion research one or two months ago, um, they found that September was actually the biggest layoff month in a, in, in a year mm. in that specific cohort that they, that they interviewed. So I'm not sure if it really was in amount, but... In terms of, you know, their, their way of questioning how many of you have laid off people this month. And I think it was the highest across the whole year. Yeah. Um, and um, we're seeing kind of some similar stuff going on right now where people are, you know, still laying off folks. Yeah. Like it's still going on. And it feels, it almost feels like it's it's another wave. We had this, um, you know, late of last year, early this year, then the summer was like, oh, it's, it's looking yeah. better now. Um, and then we have kind of the current wave that's, to a degree going on and kind of causing this. Yeah. Which then at the same time, if if you're laying off people, it's not like you are um gonna be super keen on buying new software. No. For, what, you know, for that for that area, the last thing you're gonna be doing now for a while is buying new software. In yeah, that area, yeah. Right. And kind of all of those micro things are kind of uh, adding up in the end. Yeah, I mean you you did this massive exercise to extend your runway. I uh, really now gonna go and just uh, you know make it rain with cash to buy some more shelfware. It's like no, it's it's it, that's what you don't want right now. So what are folks to do? Yeah. What are folks to do? I think what's starting to become clear across across the table when I talk to CROs and some of those communities, some of those like sales calls and so forth, it's like um I think they're starting to set in a little bit of a tiredness of, you know, the quick fix. Yeah. There's increasingly so um people are just not buying that slogan anymore. It's like, oh, you know, just this thing and ROI goes up and and it's not even about the ROI thing. It's also just about this whole mentality of, hey, you just need to, you just need to implement PLG. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then done. <laughs> First of all, it's easy to do. Yeah. And second of all, it's gonna have fantastic consequences. I think all of that quick fix mentality, yeah. I think, is starting to kind of just go out the window. I think people are starting to get tired of it. Yeah. And um, they bought the snake all too many times, and it didn't work out, right? Yeah. Um. And I think what's what's happening instead is that people are more and more um, starting to think about, well, what is the what is the real fix? Yeah. What's and and then, you know maybe even let's move away from this fix thing. Yeah. What's the real solution here? What is really broken, and what can we actually do about this? Right? Mm. Because it's not just hiring another sales rep or hiring you know uh, someone to coach the salespeople or adding another campaign or building a new feature. All of these things, and then they're like myriads of versions of that. All of these things. I feel have been in a craze, been going through in the last year and a half. Yeah. Everyone says, hey, you know, okay, you know, let's focus on net retention rate. Yeah. Let's get that up. Yeah. <laughs> let's focus on the customer because, hey, there's cheapest revenue. Well, eh, didn't yeah. work. Net dollar retention down. It's now, what, what do you say? It's now land and maintain. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, let's let's be more efficient on CAC payback. You know, let's fire some people, get more. You know, have only the the, the good reps survive. Yeah, eh, didn't work out either, yeah. right? I mean, and the list goes fucking on. Yeah. I mean, this is this doesn't stop here, right? So, and I think the, um, I think what we wanted to kind of almost do today is um, take a couple of steps back mm -hmm. and put our um, early two thousands business school goggles on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
and be like, well, let's look at this category. Let's look at this problem here yeah. uh, through sober sober eyes mm. um, and um, and see what's see what's left. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we were kind of looking at you know this really you know from a go to market execution perspective. So we could be talking about product and you need to have a differentiated offering. It needs mm. to be a good product. You need to produce it cheaply and. All of that stuff we're gonna park somewhere in another corner. Um, we're 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 here talking about uh, sales and marketing and customer success. Yeah. Um, and um, and really kind of we found you know three different areas we maybe wanted to discuss today. And let's let's see where we go with this. So number one, and we have been on this show talking the other direction previously. Yeah, so, I, I love disagreeing with myself. Yeah. Um, and um, it's just another it's just another cohort of you. Yeah, you know? <laughs> <laughs> we'll have grown yes a lot since then. Um, so one of those things is, um, you know, should you should you allow a customer in um, that you're fairly sure of is going to churn in a year? Yeah, the churn and burn. Should you do it? <laughs> and and my answer has always been, yeah, yes, yes, you should. And, you know, people that are listening and maybe investors and stuff like, oh, you know, that's really stupid. But, you know, when you're the CRO on the ground and you kind of need to hit your targets yeah. and, you know, when when really the VC is is valuing growth in general, yeah, it's almost like, well, is the next round less than a year away? Mm. Yes. Okay. Well, then that additional customer is going to help me build a better case with that VC, right? That they're churning after the round, well, you know, that's that's after the round problem. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and we have plenty of those anyway, right? Um, and then you know you could make a pretty clear. And and then the other thing is you know casting down. It's like well, who knows? Maybe yeah, this yeah. customer isn't churning. You know, yeah, who yeah. are we to know, right? Um, sorry. I think it's also just the classic. Uh, tell me how I'm measured, and I'll tell you how I'll behave. Yeah. Kind of scenario, right? Yes. It's a very real one. And and kind of the another way to look at this is um, almost through a lens of, okay, instead of CAC payback, um, and, you know, this is, you know, too almost boring, well, we should be looking at it as customer life, you know, CAC to customer lifetime, mm. right, uh, value. Um, and the idea almost would need to be, well, the customers that you want to acquire, you at least want to have um, a three X on your on your lifetime value, yeah. right, to, to CAC. Um, and we can talk about this. So what does it mean if you spend $1,000 to acquire someone, you want to, over the lifetime of this customer, want to have at least $4,000 out. Yeah. Kind of that's usually the ratio, kind of a 4, 4x. Four um, and the idea should actually be, well, everyone who's not cutting this, and let's just say instead of four, you, you set the bar at three, everyone who doesn't seem like they're ever going to cut this, should we acquire them in the first place, mm. right? So what does that mean? Well, Number one, you're you're starting to have a um, a focus on acquiring profitable customers. Yeah, profitable customers. I don't think we've ever heard that term before. No. Um, and it's very similar to um, the early days of industrialization of like, well, if it takes me ten years to assemble the chair, I can't sell it for nine. No. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't work. No, no, no. Can't do it. Yeah. Um, and uh, can't discount you. Sorry, it doesn't work, sir. Yeah. It needs to be sold for 11. Yeah. You know, there's they're just... And if you don't want to have it for 11, I understand that. Yeah. But then you need to go somewhere else. Yeah. Um, and uh, and yes, then you could have a competitive advantage if someone is assembling the same chair for eight euros. Yeah. yeah. It's like, oh, that's a problem for me now. I need yeah. to figure out how to get down to eight, right? And in our world, you know, we need to start like, yes, you know, a plus one on the customer side is is cool and everything, but you know, is it a you know, is it a profitable transaction that you're making there? Mm. Um, and it becomes very quickly unprofitable or not the right choice if you take the whole VC stuff out of the equation. If you're not optimizing for the next VC round, that is, you know, wants to see that specific metric going up. But if you're really thinking about who is going to be profitable for us, mm. then suddenly by itself, it's going to be like, well, you know, we probably need like them to renew at least twice. Yeah. Uh, for this to make sense, uh, is that customer going to renew twice? No, it's not. Mm. Problem, right? Yeah. So rather not. So this is difficult. This is a difficult decision, difficult switch, difficult everything in an organization. Because to a large degree, and this includes my own, there's almost like an... Um, uh, DNA thing attached to this. Like, yeah. Why would we say no to a customer? This doesn't. Yeah. 
in in real world, that's a real thing. Yeah, yeah. It's a real thing. Yeah, yes, you don't want to have some customers. Um, and we all learned this in, you know, you know, microeconomics in school <laughs> and stuff. Yeah, um, yeah. But but not here anymore, right? Um, the other thing is also, so what this inevitably will mean for your new business acquisition is you will, instead of 100 customers, you will only be able to acquire 80. Yeah. Because you probably have 10 to 20%, whatever the number might be, of customers that you acquire that will not turn profitable, mm. that you could even say today will not pr turn profitable, right? Kind of with fairly high conviction, you could say like, that's probably not going to work. Are you going to get it wrong once in a while? Yes. Mm. But you could say that, right? Um, and what that means, yes, your 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 initial new base is going down that you're going to be able to acquire, but in return, it actually also means you can reduce the sales team that you have. Yeah. Instead of closing 100 deals, you actually can really only close 80. Mm. Um, and that means you need fewer reps to cycle through this. What's going to happen also is that you're going to reduce, you know, the worst 20% of reps. Yeah. Um, you know, first, um, meaning the reps that you have left will be uh, higher on conversion, higher on ACV, you know, show all the right signs, yada, yada, right? Uh, which basically means you basically uh, improve the efficiency of the sales team by taking out the, the bottom 20%. Yeah. yeah. And if you kind of find this all the way up, you probably might see that, you know, those 20 bottom percent of, you know, bad-ish customers are connected to some stuff that you're doing on the top end of the funnel that's kind of leading to this. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't, right? Great, you can cut this out now as well. Yeah. Right? Um. So this is just one way of... Yes, CAC payback, I think it's super operationally important and helpful. Yeah. Um, but, you know, in this sense, it's starting to be almost damaging because it's telling you you should acquire customers that are not profitable for you. Mm. Um, figuring out a way to almost switch to a, well, we need customers that renew twice. Yeah. Um, you know, way, I think that starts to be uh, the more sensible way to do it. When, when I bought software back in like 2015, um, what I heard often on sales calls, I'm not sure if this is still a thing, uh, you know, the sales rep, and this was kind of a, a thing they just said, but sales reps were sometimes saying, well, you know, we really need you to um, renew at least once for this to make sense, right? So that they were almost pointing out the CAC payback implementation. Yeah. Um, and I think some of that thinking, uh, whether or not fake or not, um, I think some of that should actually come back, Yeah. Um, right? And I think the the North Star metric for you to kind of think about here is uh, CAC to customer lifetime value. Mm. Yeah. So this was one topic, one small topic. Yeah. Um, <laughs> which means you know just okay customers aren't good enough anymore, right? Yeah. You need good customers for you to kind of turn profitable and be profitable going forward. Um, the next one is maybe a bit more divisive, uh, divisive, divisive. Um, it's you know okay, okay people is not enough anymore. And, um, you know, present company not excluded. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Give us that review. Yeah. Give us it. Um, it really means that, um, you know, people that were successful in the last 10 years, mm. um, uh, that might just not be the bar anymore for the next 10 years. Yeah. I think this is what's, this is what's happening to a degree. And, and I think some of this is also echoed by uh, Jocko and, and then yeah. some of those folks. Hey, you know, you really have bad sales reps. That's really what's happening. Mm. Um, he also talks about, well, you have kind of bad leaders that grew up in the, you know, between 2012 and 2022. Yeah. Myself, basically, yeah, yeah. Um, who don't understand this whole thing and therefore make, you know, obviously bad decisions. Um, and I think the same is true for marketers, for CS, yeah. across the whole board, right? Yeah, I mean, we talked about it. I mean we grew up on this stuff and it was easier. So if you ran a marketing campaign, it was a whole lot easier to go and start Google ads, Facebook audiences and get something through. Right. But now with the cost rising conversion rates down funnel also impacted, it gets a whole lot harder. Right. So if, if, if that was your tool, basically now you need to go and find a couple of other things. If it's the marketing side, then you know what creative actually gets really important. Can you turn a really good message that stands out? Mm -hmm. Can you have created a high converting landing page and a consistent journey after that fact? Are you following up within, you know, minutes and not days with mm -hmm. those leads and so on and so on. So I think, you know, there are some almost basic skills that are now paramount to success that weren't in the last, five, 10 years. Sure, there were folks doing it because they kind of understood also some of the compound you can mm. bake in. 
But those things, they become critical. And if you've not grown up on it, and especially not faced that challenge as you know a lot of folks are facing now, then there's a lot of learning to be to be made. No, absolutely. And I think this this does translate into um, I think the expectations we need to both as employees coming to the workplace um, and as you know leaders, mm. you know working with those employees. So it's almost like a kind of a, you know two sided world here. But like in 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 all cases, I think we need to start increasing our standards of what we think is is right mm. or what is acceptable or is yeah what's necessary to survive in this area um or this time and um i think for you know this goes all the way down to simple stuff you know sales reps need to be bad at discovery apparently this is you know chris Orlop talked about this you know jaco talked about this discovery is where you lose most of your deals yeah that's simply a skill yeah that you can learn yeah, right so this is I'm learning this skill right now, by the way. So it's like, <laughs> it's not impossible. And it doesn't mean that everyone is going to be good at this, but this is certainly a skill that you can teach and kind of, you know, work on. Um, and then you need to have the the disciplined, hardworking mentality, you know, of those salespeople to, you know, keep doing that stuff and yeah. keep getting better at this stuff and so forth, right? And and if if there are people that don't want to go down that path, okay. Yeah. But then that's probably not a fit anymore, right? And I think... Um, Kind of this whole decision making around who is good for the team is like, well, is 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 a filled seat better than an empty seat? Which yeah. was very much the case like two or three years ago. Um, I think that stopped now already. But I would even go further. It's like a mediocre uh, seat that's filled. Yeah, is that better than an empty seat? Yeah. Um, and I think um, you know, we 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 basically need to start asking ourselves those questions, right? Yeah. And and basically pushing up the bar. Um, but again, from both sides, right? I think as an as employees come to the workplace, you kind of also, you know, want to see the same thing from from your leaders, mm. right? So this is kind of a two thing. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's also the standard that you apply to yourself, and that goes for leaders and employees. As like the standards you apply to yourself, they simply need to be higher now. Yeah. Right? Period. Um, and, you know, we were joking before the, before the show, right? Some people say like, hey, the golden age of SaaS is over. I just believe the convenient age of SaaS is over. Yeah. Right? Kind of, it's just not as simple and it's not that convenient anymore. Um, and I think that that needs to translate to uh, real business change and mm. real that sometimes means real real talent change as well, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, maybe some of those companies that we all try to flee, <laughs> <laughs> maybe there's some uh, some areas that they've figured out, and you know they're crazy focused on you know which people they're gonna take on and yeah. you know, how they're building them out and um, how much honestly how much work they expect from them. Yeah. Um, it's there's a whole other there's a whole other area where I think we can um, we can uh, learn from and, and take some of those learnings and kind of adopt and, and learn from those older companies. But it's so funny because uh, in the prep for this, when looking at GTM execution, you know what all those BCG, McKinsey's, all those folks talked about the importance. Number one, most critical thing, right people with the right skill set. Yeah. That was like th this is business 101. Mm -hmm. And I think what happened back then when, you know, you could raise a lot of cash, you could succeed with just mediocre effort, then it was totally legit to go and hire someone straight out of school. So you had actually a very, it, you had a lot of junior folks on the team and mm -hmm. a few that had some experience and that was good enough, but it doesn't work out today. And I think the job becomes looking at that team and saying, hey, how is the balance of the team in terms of experience and performance? And then asking, you know, the very painful question. So do we need to cut some? Are there some we can train and actually lift up? And how, like, how do we do that? And it will be very much dependent on the business, how much time you have, mm -hmm. what outcomes you're gunning for. But I think it's just, you know, those folks on the team, if you're a leader, they represent a significant amount of burn every single yeah. month. Yes. Every single month. And, and you being like, ah, you know, it's kind of good enough. You know, we that, that, is, friends. that is that is that is where the problem actually kicks in. Yeah. It's like you need to um, I think you need to be uh, it, 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 those those current times kind of sometimes required to be yeah. a little bit more tough around this. Right? And I think we almost sound a bit American talking about this subject, you know, hey, maybe you should cut some folks. But I think it's just very clear that we've come from a period where we could construct teams like that and it doesn't cut it anymore. It doesn't work anymore. And, and it's it totally sucks if you're in that position and have to make some tough decisions. But ultimately, if you're a leader, 
then no but also don't get me wrong right you um you know some people will be like well but you can coach them and teach them and enable them and yeah, th yeah, i sure. think that's totally true i think many many times uh the employee failing is because the company failed them yeah, you yeah. Know, more than anything else but in reality you know with the timeline and the skills that you and resource that you have now it's like, well, can you even afford to try and kind of improve this now? Yeah. yeah. Do, you, do you have time to do it? Because yeah, yeah. this whole enablement piece, it does take some time, mm -hmm. right? Um, and you might have screwed some things up so badly already that, you know, un unscrewing it up yeah. will take even more time, yeah. right? So it's like, and you, you need to figure out, you know, what your best path through this is. And sometimes it means, um, um, Sometimes it means kind of parting ways for folks. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah. This yeah, is like, sucks. We're, 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 it's like a really like a chief <laughs> revenue officer talk here today. And no, just but fire them, you know, <laughs> done. <laughs> no, but it is a thing. Like there is a runway that the business has. Mm -hmm. And if that runway is 24 months yeah. and you have half your team that you need to upskill, it's going to take you 12 months to upskill and then some are not going to succeed. Yeah. And then, you know, so the math just won't work out. I'm sorry. It's terrible. And it's not the necessarily just the team's fault. It, these were the times. Yeah. These were the times. Um, so it sucks. Um, so we talked about okay customers. We talked about okay people not being enough anymore. Um, I think the last thing we have on our list here is um, okay infrastructure. Yeah. You know, running your go to market with just okay infrastructure, right? And um, I've been there myself. Mm. You know, we've seen this. I mean, it's like you have a spreadsheet for this, yeah. you have, you know, an Asana for that, you have a Salesforce report for this, and you know, like all of that stuff, that, you know, all of that stuff is okay. Don't get me wrong, it works um, to, to a degree. But I think kind of up, you know, upskilling this and leveling this up in, into a degree where uh, actually you can, uh, you know, manage your go-to-market execution. Mm. I think that increasingly so is something that uh, is required for you to run good e go-to-market execution, right? And you could say, sure, this kind of maybe... A, a Groblox topic, and it is for sure that. I think there are many other ways to also think about it in terms of like, okay, how how can we actually kind of run this ship uh, in a much, much tighter way? Yeah. How can we integrate all of these things without over-engineering it? Don't get me wrong, right? You don't want to fall off the spectrum on the other side either. Um, but, you know, this all of this fragmented stuff that we're seeing out there, all those poorly run, uh, you know, companies that, uh, basically kind of not poorly run because they have the wrong people or the wrong customers. They're just not, you know, having this integrated in the right way to even have those conversations, right? Yeah. Kind of the infrastructure piece. Think about think about it as the backbone of your go-to-market. And if it's not there, if it's scrappy, if it's shitty, that will inevitably have an impact on how you're going to be able to execute. Part of that conversation is reven revenue operations. Yes, yeah. yes. I think part of that conversation is revenue architecture, so, you know, some folks kind of more and more wake up to this, uh, obviously kind of winning by design, but also talk to the Kremansky folks out of uh, out of Germany, predominantly, actually. Um, they see company, you know, over company and company and company, and it's it's a great product. They have good salespeople. Mm. They're just putting the pieces not together in yeah. the right way. Right? I, think, I think one very real example is I came from a uh, PLT self-serve kind of business, and uh, we didn't have any instrumentation to measure the self sign up, right? We didn't have those stages defined. We didn't have the measurements in mm. place. We just had a traffic and then sign ups. So we had no clue what was happening in between. And I think this was the result of the whole hey, we need to move fast. Let's just implement. Let's go, mm. right? And I think now you need to kind of maybe pause for a minute and say, hey, sure, we need to move fast, but let's also make sure we get the implementation or instrumentation right. So we actually know what is happening in our business. And you know, we, we kind of have sometimes a saying, you kind of the the best performing companies are usually also the ones that are the worst run. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, once some of that magical growth comes down because of a variety of reasons, suddenly you start implementing all of those, uh, you know, management systems, yeah. so to speak, in order to solidify or kind of get those things fixed again, right? And and I know for a fact in the heydays of H&M, so the fashion yeah. brand, um and this is this goes back to maybe 2018. I'm not sure if it was still the heydays, but it's like <laughs> they were still growing like crazy. Yeah. Um, they were managing this whole conglomerate through like hundreds and thousands of spreadsheets. Spreadsheets, <laughs> right? And this is not for not only top li uh, line planning and stuff, for the whole thing, basically kind of spreadsheets. And I think if you 
have a really successful, basically, product market fit, right? If if your product is great, you're being you know ripped into the market, you mm. almost can't sell enough. Um, all of all of these things that kind of fall by the wayside, and who gives a shit? Yeah, honestly, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Kind of you you would just be wasting time trying to fix this. You should just instead hire more salespeople so you know someone can take those calls. Right? Yeah. That time I stopped. Yeah. For like ninety five percent of the folks out there. Uh, the time is very much done. It's like, well, not more salespeople, but we need to run a more efficient engine here. We need yeah. to run a more efficient shop. And in order to achieve that, you need to have instrumentation in place that lets you, you know, uh, puts you in a place to actually do it. Yeah. And if you think about manufacturing businesses and, you know, all kind of the old school stuff, mm. um, are they just having kind of the machine there and kind of look at this once in a while? It's like, yeah, that runs good enough. <laughs> What's that lamp blinking? Yeah. Is it supposed to blink? <laughs> it's probably like the engine light in my car. It probably doesn't matter. You know, it blinks all the time, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know. Um, and, um, you know, think about how they are running their production. Yeah. Think about that. And then, you know, in, you know, take this in and then look at your go-to-market. And I'm like, are you running it the same way? Yeah, or are you yeah. running the scrappy amateur version of that? Yeah. Um, and likely you, you you're running the scrappy amateur version of it which you know again i don't want to offend anyone we're offending a lot of people you know, just fire everyone and we know, don't take together. those customers we're and, in it together yeah, yeah. at least um uh, and um and kind of look at this and like no this is amateur this is amateur B bs we need to upgrade this yeah. um and to a degree it's almost like technical debt in your product right yeah. it's is it gonna add something? No, it doesn't feel like it, right? You're fixing technical debt in your product, and like, oh, who cares? Mm. Um, but these things will drag you down and drag you under yeah, uh, from yeah. a product production side, and it's the same thing for go to market as well. Yeah, yeah, and the customer will be on the recipient of that. Yeah. So, I think what is a pretty cool thing is if you actually achieve in bringing this from okay to let's say good or great. Just imagine the point in time where. All of a sudden the stories start changing that actually now the sales cycle length they're getting shorter quota completion are improving the companies that actually manage to build you know a solid engine of profitable customers a great team and a solid infrastructure and setup they're going to be set up way better for success yeah i think so no that's absolutely what it is but let's see if those times come back we don't who know knows? who knows who knows um but yeah, to wrap it up, I think you know all the all the arrows and pointers are still going in the wrong direction. At least, kind of based on you know recent benchmarks from uh, OpenView. And I think what we are saying is like just OK just simply isn't good enough anymore. Mm. Uh, OK customers that stay with you for a year maybe not good enough anymore. OK teams that you know don't have a really good expert view and you know working hard and figuring things out not good enough anymore. Mm. Your spreadsheet and you know business system here and so forth set up that you're trying to use in order to run your go-to-market not good enough anymore. Upgrade all of that stuff. That's it. Cheers. That's it. Thank you everyone. Have a good one. Bye. Bye bye.